Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Today we're taking a look at GPU performance in the recently released Battlefield 2042 title, a game that I'm sure you're no doubt very familiar with. And that being the case, I'm not going to waste time talking about gameplay or review this thing in any way. The idea here is to measure graphics card performance so you can get an idea of what you'll need to get into the action. Like all previous Battlefield titles, developer DICE is relying on the Frostbite game engine using the third version which was also used by Battlefield 5, Battlefield 1, Battlefield Hardline, and Battlefield 4. As you'd probably expect, if you've seen any gameplay, this is a modified or updated version of the Frostbite game engine that supports new weather effects, amongst other things. Visually, Battlefield 2042 is breathtaking and certainly one of the best looking games I've ever experienced. I first jumped in with an RTX 3090 at 4K and the frame rates were decent, not as high as I'd like for competitive gameplay, but they were surprisingly good given the visuals. Still, I couldn't help but think the game was going to murder mid-range hardware, even at 1080p, and it'd just be a struggle with a modest graphics card. But I've got to say, it is far better optimised than I was expecting. However, that isn't to say the game isn't without its issues, there are certainly a good number of bugs still present, but overall, for an EA game, it does appear to be fairly well polished. Or at least it did in my testing. Of course, I had to deal with the crappy Origin launcher, the five hardware lockout DRM trash, but after buying a little over half a dozen EA Play accounts for a month, plus my personal Steam version, I've been able to test a good number of GPUs over the past three days or so. So let's talk about testing as the Battlefield games are always very fun in that regard. Now, given this is a multiplayer only game, we're forced to test that portion of the game. And while I'm sure many of you would love us to jump into a 64 player conquest match to do all of our testing, it's simply not possible and it's anything but accurate. Even if I was to only compare two different hardware configurations, which is realistically about all we could do for that type of testing, you'd still need at least a dozen benchmark passes for each hardware configuration just to get a ballpark comparison. And that's due to the dynamic nature of multiplayer games. Depending on where other players are on the map and what they're doing, system performance can vary quite a lot, making run-to-run -run variants very inconsistent. My workaround here was to use the new portal mode to create my own benchmark server with AI, as this would be both CPU and GPU heavy, and likely do a pretty good job of accurately representing real world performance. Sadly though, being that this is an EA game, that feature didn't work for the first two days of testing, so I wasn't actually able to try it. Instead I've used the Eureka Harbor free for all custom experience without any other players. Now, before you go stamping your feet in protest claiming this isn't an accurate way to test the game, as it doesn't replicate the kind of load you'll see in big multiplayer games, that's actually not true, at least for a GPU test. And I know this because I spent quite a lot of time comparing both modes on the same map. The reason for this being that additional players don't really increase the GPU load, but rather the CPU load, and because I'm using a Ryzen 9 5950X with low latency memory, at no point was either mode approaching anywhere near CPU limited performance. In fact, for the most part, the frame rates were very similar. It was just a lot easier to control the test scene without players shooting at me. So to be clear, for GPU testing, this mode is perfectly fine. And since we're only interested in GPU performance for this video, the method works. What it's not suitable for is CPU testing. And for that, we will be using a completely different method, hopefully using Portal to create a custom match. Now, for testing, we have data from 33 different GPUs at three resolutions, as well as two quality presets, and then for a bonus, I've also included ray tracing results as well. Again, for testing, I'm using the Ryzen 9 5950X test system with 32 gigabytes of dual rank, dual channel DDR4 3200CL14 memory. Okay, let's jump into the data, as we do have a lot to go over. Starting with the 1080p ultra quality data, we find that the GeForce RTX 3090, 3080 Ti, Radeon RX 6900 XT, and RTX 3080 all pushed up over 150 FPS, while keeping the 1% low above 100 FPS. So great performance there, given the visuals. The 6800 XT was also right up there, basically matching the RTX 3080. Then we see a bit of a drop down to the RX 6800 and RTX 3070 Ti, but again, both did maintain over 100 FPS at all times. The RTX 2080 Ti, RTX 3070, 6700 XT, and 3060 Ti were all fairly comparable and did average over 100 FPS. Then we drop down another performance tier with the RTX 2080, 2070 Super, 5700 XT, 6600 XT, 1080 Ti, and RTX 3060. 
And here we have yet another new game where the 5700 XT is found punching well above its weight, beating not just the 1080 Ti, but basically matching the 2070 Super, a product, if you remember, cost $100 US more. So a very impressive result there from the 5700 XT, while the 6600 XT was a lot less impressive in my opinion, but we've come to expect that. Now, if we head down towards 60 FPS on average, we find the GeForce GTX 1080, 1660 Ti, and Radeon RX Vega 56. Vega actually also does quite well here, as traditionally you wouldn't have expected Vega 56 to almost match the GTX 1080, but that's what we're seeing here, and that meant it did beat the GTX 1070, which also just averaged 60 FPS. Then we have the 5500 XT 8GB hanging in there with 55 FPS on average, making it only slightly faster than the Never Say Die RX 580, which edged out its competitor, the GTX 1060. Meanwhile, the 4GB cards all died a slow and painful death here, with the 5500 XT unable to deliver playable performance, while the 1650 series was almost impossible to test. Jumping up to 1440p, we see that the Ampere GPU start to take over with the 3090, 3080 Ti and 3080 all pulling ahead of the 6900 XT in our test. The 6900 XT averaged 112 FPS, making it a few frames faster than the 6800 XT, which was 10% faster than the vanilla 6800. The RX 6800 did compete well with the RTX 3070 Ti and 3070, and I kind of get the feeling that maybe VRAM is starting to become an issue here for some of these faster 8GB cards. The 2080 Ti, for example, certainly felt smoother than the newer 3070, despite frame rates being almost identical. So it's very possible after a longer test period, the 3070 would really start to struggle with memory usage, and that's something I'll have to explore in a future test. Again, frame time consistency was better with the 12GB 6700 XT, though as we drop down the list, the slower 8GB cards seem less phased by the VRAM consumption, at least in our fairly short 3-run average testing. Again, the 5700 XT can be found punching above its weight, almost matching the 2070 Super, making it a good bit faster than the 2060 Super and 2070. Then we see that the RTX 3060 also performed well with just over 60 FPS on average, and we also see the 2060 Super and 2070 basically hitting 60 FPS. The RX 5600 XT and RX 6600 were able to deliver a good playable experience with just shy of 60 FPS, and the RTX 2060 also did quite well at 1440p despite the more limited 6GB VRAM buffer. Interestingly, the move up to 1440p saw Vega 56 manage to edge out the GTX 1080, or at the very least match it. So an impressive result there for the old GCN architecture. Most of the Pascal GPUs struggled at this resolution, and we see that below the GTX 1070, the 5500 XT and RX 580 weren't really playable, at least by competitive online shooter standards. And again, anything with just 4GB of VRAM was completely unplayable using the ultra quality settings. Moving up to 4K, and here we have a lot less usable data. The RTX 3090 pumped out an impressive 80 FPS, which made for a breathtaking experience. And while this is a lot less than what I'd want for a multiplayer shooter, as far as the visual experience goes, it was very incredible. The same can be said about the RTX 3080 Ti and even the standard 3080. Then we have the 6900 XT and 6800 XT. They were less impressive as the 1% low wasn't kept above 60 FPS, but overall still a nice experience. And for those of you wanting to keep the average over 60 FPS, you'll find yourself struggling with an RTX 3070 Ti or RX 6800. And by the time we get down to the 5700 XT and 2070 Super, we're struggling to keep the FPS above 40. Okay, so let's dial back the quality preset a few notches from ultra to medium. Doing so greatly reduces VRAM requirements and of course overall GPU horsepower. As a result, the 6900 XT is now pushing up near 200 FPS at 1080p, with the most current generation high-end GPUs good for over 170 FPS. In fact, if we scroll down to previous generation mid-range parts like the 5600 XT and RTX 2060, we find that under these conditions, these parts are good for just over 100 FPS. So incredibly, most graphics cards will be able to deliver highly playable performance at 1080p using the medium quality preset. In fact, for 60 FPS, you need only the RX 580, 1650 Super, or GTX 1060 6GB. Jumping up to 1440p still sees most GPUs able to deliver highly playable performance with the medium quality preset. Again, the high-end current generation GPUs are pushing over 140 FPS, with previous gen models still easily breaking the 100 FPS barrier. 
We see that the 2070 Super is a bit faster than the 5700 XT with 95 FPS on average versus 87, while the 1080 Ti was good for 82 FPS. And even Vega 56 performed really well with 66 FPS on average, and incredibly, that got it very close to the 2060 Super. And then we see that the RX 580 did dip down to 47 FPS on average, but that still meant it was 18% faster than the GTX 1060 6GB. Now at the 4K resolution, the high-end Ampere GPUs come up just short of 100 FPS, which is a great result, especially given that the 6900 XT averaged 86 FPS, making it slower than the RTX 3080. That said, further down the stack, the RX 6800 did well, edging out the 3070 Ti and comfortably beating the standard 3070. Then for around 60 FPS, you will require an RTX 3060 Ti, 2080 Ti, or 3070, with the Radeon RX 6700 XT just falling short with 58 FPS on average. Below that, you really are just best off lowering the resolution. Okay, so now it's time to look at performance using the ultra quality preset with ray traced ambient occlusion enabled. Now, in the case of the RTX 3080, we're looking at a 22% decline in performance with ray tracing enabled at 1080p and a 19% decline for the RTX 3060. Then from AMD, we're looking at a 26% performance hit with ray tracing enabled for the 6800 XT and a 27% drop for the RX 6600. So slightly bigger performance hit there for AMD as you'd probably expect. In fact, you might have expected the performance hit with ray tracing enabled to be a bit more severe for the red team. Anyway, at 1080p, the game was still very playable with ray tracing enabled with really any of the graphics cards tested. That said, I really only recommend playing with RT enabled with the higher end models. Though having said that, you might personally be fine with 60 FPS on average, so I guess ultimately that's really up to you to decide. Now at 1440p, we're looking at around a 30 FPS performance hit for the Radeon GPUs with RT enabled and a 20% hit for the GeForce GPUs. This meant the 6900 XT was now 17% slower than the RTX 3090, while the 6800 XT was also 17% slower than the RTX 3080. Those seeking 60 FPS will get away with the RTX 2080 or 2070 Super, and then from AMD, you'll have to make do with the 6700 XT. No surprises at 4K, you'll want the RTX 3090, 3080 Ti, or 3080 for the best performance. While you can sort of enjoy the game with the 6900 XT and 6800 XT, but the experience is much better with RT disabled on those Radeon GPUs. Okay, so we've now seen how a few dozen AMD and NVIDIA GPUs perform in Battlefield 2042. Now the question is, how much difference do the quality settings that I tested actually make to the visuals? So let's take a look at that. The quality difference between medium and ultra is quite substantial, though the differences won't always jump out at you. Essentially though, everything is improved. You get better textures, lighting, post-processing, vegetation, and so on when using the ultra quality preset. And depending on the scenario, the differences really do jump out at you, and they do, in my opinion, justify the 20 to 30% decrease in performance. Then we have the ray traced ambient occlusion, which does have quite a significant impact on visuals, though not always for the best. And this example here really illustrates both the good and bad of ray traced ambient occlusion in Battlefield 2042. The debris around the burnt out car looks much better with ray tracing enabled, as there's a greater emphasis on shading here that really jumps out at you, and these objects now have a lot more depth to them, making them look a lot more realistic. And the same also applies to the dumpster next to the building. So that's the good stuff. The bad can be seen when looking at the floating debris, which has a really unpleasant ghosting effect that trails off for quite a long distance. I'm not sure why, but it does. It looks horrible and it completely breaks immersion, or at least it did for me. Now this alone would be enough for me personally to turn ray tracing off, and they really need to fix this because otherwise it is very impressive. Overall though, ray tracing does help to make the game look more realistic, so if they can fix the dynamic particle issue, it would certainly be worth using. That said, I feel most Battlefield gamers will be favouring FPS performance over visual quality, and not only that, but the medium quality preset generally makes it much easier to spot enemies, so while ultra with ray tracing generally looks quite amazing, it's not the best way to play the game, at least not competitively. So that's my look at GPU performance in Battlefield 2042. How what an utter nightmare this game was to test, but of course that is always the situation with EA and Origin type games. But anyway, I think the data has been worth it. For those of you targeting 1080p gaming, the good news is 
just about anything seems to work with their medium quality preset, uh, assuming that you have the CPU power to fully unleash the GPU. And of course, I will be looking at CPU performance soon using a different test method. Point is though, you should be right with the 1650 Super or RX 580 at 1080p using medium. And then for those wanting to experience the ultra quality settings, the GTX 1070 or Vega 56 will be required, or of course, anything better. Needless to say, all currently released generation GPUs work really well. Then for 1440p medium, something like the GTX 1660 Ti or GTX 1080 will enable a 60 FPS experience, as will Vega 56. But if you want to crank the visuals right up here with the ultra quality preset, then you'll really want something like an RTX 2060 Super, RTX 3060, or the 6600 XT slash RX 5700. On that note, AMD's previous generation RDNA GPUs performed exceptionally well here, and it was really good to see the 5700 XT hanging in there with the 2070 Super. Overall, Battlefield 2042 looks very promising and is no doubt set to become a standard inclusion amongst the games we use for benchmarking. For now, I am keen to start comparing AMD and Intel CPUs, so I'm gonna go do that, and then I'll probably mess around with the portal mode to see what the best options are there for testing CPUs. So fingers crossed the portal mode actually works now. Uh, if you did enjoy this video, please do give it a like because it was a tremendous amount of work over the last three-ish days. I haven't really slept a whole lot. I've just been testing GPU after GPU and creating new Origin accounts to get around that five hardware lockout. But thankfully, I was able to use some accounts two or three times, but there was still, yeah, I, I purchased a lot of one month EA Play accounts, which is a bit ridiculous, but that is the situation with EA Origin and all that nonsense. So yeah, like, subscribe, do that stuff. Uh, if you'd like to support us directly and get some cool perks in return, we have Float Plane on Patreon, links for those in the video description. You get access to a monthly live stream we do for Hardware Box community members, our exclusive Discord chat, behind the scenes content, Q&As, a lot of cool stuff there. So if you're interested, check it out. If not, that is perfectly fine. And I would like to just thank you for watching. I'm your host, Steve. I'll see you again next time.